Hello everyone, my name is Octavian. Um, I work for Intel, I'm part of the Open Source Technology Center. And I'm here to talk about some of the work we have been doing um, in order to shape the existing MPTCP implementation um, so that we can eventually merge it upstream. Um, our group has been working with uh, Multipath TCP in a couple of research projects, and I have been involved um, in, you know, in the capacity to try and see what we can do in order to uh, merge MPTCP upstream. I think that it's important because as you will see, we have some interesting use cases with MPTCP, but those use cases cannot really be deployed if uh, we don't have, um, you know, real operating system support uh, for MPTCP. So um, here's the agenda. Um, I want to try and uh, very briefly explain what MPTCP is, and then I'm going to present some of the important use cases, and then we're going to dive into the implementation. Um, basically, the, the existing implementation and then some of the work we did so that we can, um, you know, make it more clean and make it more, less changes as we'll see uh, to the TCP stack. Um, my, my objective for this talk is to keep it short and then to um, make, so, to have some sort of a discussion to get your feedback and to see, you know, what is the right way um, what we can do to, you know, to get slowly to that point where you can merge uh, multipath TCP upstream. Okay, so um, let's start with um, briefly describing what uh, multipath TCP is about. So multipath TCP, it's um, a multipath solution done at the transport layer. It is um, an IETF standard. I think it's ex experimental at this stage. And uh, what it tries to do, it tries to take advantage of the multipath multi -path between uh, two endpoints, and it tries to do so in a compatible way, um, application compatible as well as network compatible. The idea being that you don't want to change the application uh, once you have support, multipath TCP support in that stack, then you don't need to compile your application, you'll just be able to um, use the multipaths available if there are any. And also, uh, it was designed with, with a few um, things in mind. It should work as well as TCP. It uh, should work when TCP works. Uh, it, if you know we cannot use the multipath extension, it should vol fall back to TCP. So at least we, you know we ha we have the connections uh, going. And it also has some um, um, some some thought has been done for the congestion part, so it tries to be fair with TCP. For instance, if you have a multipath TCP, which we are going to see that is using multiple flows, um, it tries not, you know, to be fair from a congestion point of view and to act just like a TCP um, um, connection. Even if we can have, for instance, uh, two flows and we have an, another additional TCP um, connection, it should. Um, so to speak, eat half of the bandwidth, not you know one, uh, two thirds for the multipath and one third for TCP. So um, let's now look at a few use cases. I think one of the um, obvious use cases for multipath TCP, especially with today's um, focus on mobility, is the one where you want to use uh, two two. Uh, to paths like 3G and Wi-Fi. So you usually have your um, mobile phone, you have uh, 3G and Wi-Fi connectivity, and with a multipath TCP, you are going to be able to use both of these connections without needing to change the application, and also you can f uh, fail over from one connection to the other, you can use both connections, and uh, you, this is done completely transparent. Um, the application doesn't need to do a thing. The connection is not going to be interrupted. You don't need to uh, reopen the connection. So that's, this is one of the um, typical use cases. Other use cases are, you know, um, let's say a roaming use case where you're in the office, uh, you are connected to the uh, wire net network, and then you move to the, you know, um, you move to the, um, conference room and you're connected uh, via wireless and if you want to keep your existing connections um, active you can do so with multipath TCP. Uh, multipath TCP is not only about you know keeping the connection active it also has nice um, side effect that it will if you are connected to the multiple uh, paths and if you know the quality of the links 
um, um, the quality of the link varies, it will offer you the best throughput, right? Um, especially this is important when you are mobile and you're, let's say that you're connected to two access points. In that case, you don't know in advance which one is the best to use, so we use best and as the quality of the link decreases, uh, you will switch traffic away from one link to the, uh, to the other link and you get the best throughput. And um, the same can be, I mean, the same uh, thing can be um, said about uh, latency as well. You, you'll get the same uh, benefits for latency. So here we have um, a nice little graph that um, um, we, ha we, ha we had some experiments um, with um, the mobile device uh, connected to the 3G to the 3G network and also to the Wi-Fi here, we actually have, uh, we take a trip to, uh, through the subway and in the stations we have access points and you can clearly see that when we reach the station, you, you, you see the, um, the blue um, lines going up. Basically, we have um, throughput through the Wi-Fi um, connectivity. Um, there are all other interesting multipath TCP use cases. So, uh, for instance, um, there are papers that talk about how you can improve uh, power, how you can reduce the power consumption, and basically that's um, a race to idle. You use both, I mean, as many um, interfaces as you have in order to have a higher throughput, and because of that, you'll, you'll finish the download faster, and then you'll go to sleep um, faster. Other use cases are, interesting use cases are the multi-Wi-Fi project, which basically says that, okay, let's, um, let's, let's connect the um, mobile devices to multiple access points and with that we can avoid that um, through, I mean, the link quality issues because we don't know in advance which, uh, which link is going to be better. Um, and there have been some research in the uh, data center as well uh, because in data center you usually have um, spare links, you can use multipath TCP to improve uh, throughput. Okay, so now let's go over a few MPTCP basics. Um, and I'm gonna present, uh, present a handshake and a few things that we, um, uh, that we need to know about MPTCP. So basically, uh, as I mentioned, MPTCP is presented to the application as a single socket, and then uh, the implementation will create multiple TCP-like connections, um, and they're almost TCP-like connections. So we are going to start with the scene, and then we have a special option which is called MP-capable, and this is how you open the first connection. Uh, this is going to the server, and the server is going to reply back also the MP-capable, uh, which means that the, the server knows, um, talks MPTCP, so we can use MPTCP then. And uh, we have one connection established. You can see that we have the state for that connection and it's just a TCP uh, connection state. Um, usual, usual things like uh, um, sequence numbers, the, um, the window and so on. Now, let's say that we are also connected to a Wi-Fi hotspot in when uh, the MPTCP uh, implementation the MPTCP stack will detect that we have a new interface and uh, it is available. It will try to open a soft flow. This is what we called it, uh, which is another TCP connection. You see that it sends a special SYN packet with the join um, multipath um, option. That's basically, it tells the server that it wants to attach this second uh, TCP connection to the same uh, logical MPTCP connection. And this is going to the server. The server will, will say, okay, um, um, I added the flow, this soft flow to the connection, and we now have two uh, TCP soft flows um, going on. Now, the, in order to, because we can send packets on either of these links, we need to distinguish between you know, how to order the packets because uh, the, the MPTCP connection is, be, is presented to the user just like a regular TCP session, right? So we have um, other MPTCP options which say, which maps basically the um, soft flow packets to the um, connection, soft flow, yeah, soft flow packets to the connection level. Uh, so we basically have a double uh, sequence um, space, uh, one for the soft flow and one for the um, multipath connection, overall connection. And you can see here that we have um, data and sequences to order the, the um, basically, there are um, the, the important, um, 
part here is the data sequence, which tells you uh, which we know how to order the packets across the, the connection, and also we have um, a an, an data arc which, which uh, um, acknowledges the package at the MBDCP connection level. Okay, any questions so far about the, the protocol? Yes. Um, so the choice, yeah, actually, perfect mm -hmm. picture. So when the cell phone in this case is picking the alternate path, what layer of the stack? So is it the TCP stack that's saying I have a second path because then you're divorcing it from routing? Is it a bonding decision? How do you decide? It, it is the MPTCP stack. Uh, so basically, uh, the, for example, the way it's currently implemented, we listen for Netlink um, events when the interface comes up. And we detect the interface, we, detect, we also see that it has an IP address attached, and once we have that, uh, we basically you know, start the this, this second flow. But then that's not sufficient. Or if somebody has to do a routing lookup to say, this oh, particular that. interface is also viable, right? Because you might have, let's say, hundreds of interfaces. Mm -hmm. Or is that not the use case? The use case is that there are two interfaces that are connected to the same subnet, and. And that's the requirement? Um, I'm not sure I understand so, the question. So let's say I have 100 interfaces. How mm -hmm. do I decide what my second interface is? Well, yeah. Um, the, the way on how you decide you know, when, if you want to start a subflow or not is, is done in a separate. Uh, so basically, MPTCP implementation right now it's, um, kind of has separate modules. So we have, for instance, a module to decide on which, um, uh, which way to send a packet, and you also have a module to decide if you want to start or not the um, uh, subflow on, on which interfaces. Uh, right now, I think we have um, two, uh, two ways of, of, of doing this. We can say that um, you know, uh, we want to start a subflow on, we can start even multiple subflows on the same um, network inf interface. That or, one's easy yeah. to understand. Okay, or it's you can, you, or you, can say, you can say, okay, we want to start. Um, Is it not multiple? You, you do like what SCTP does, correct? The app has to do multiple connects. Not, not the app. Uh, this is decided by the MPTCP layer itself. Okay, so how, all right. It's how does transparent it to the application. All right, I guess I'm just as confused as... Uh, so, I mean, once you have, you know, you, you have one interface, right? Um, you know what the other, uh, you, you start the connection from one interface to the other um, IP endpoint, let's say, and then you have another um, interface which has, you know, you, ju you just associated an access point, you get an IP address, and you use that IP address to open a new connection to the, the same peer, basically. I think the question is how do you know that address is reachable through that interface? That um, we just try it, if it doesn't work, we... So it's, uh, why? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, it, uh, ra yeah, I think we have um, different modules. Um, so if you use, uh, we have one module which is called end if port, and that will basically tell you that you can start, um, you can set the number of soft flows that you can open on a per um, interface level. It's configurable. And, and I mean, also, um, um, these sorts of policy decisions, I think they are, they are hard to, you know, to uh, design in a universal way. That's why um, we have kind of this um, pluggable approach where you can, um, you know, write multiple um, policy maker, let's say, uh, modules. Because in one use case, it may it make me perfect sense to use, uh, you know, um, one flow for each, each sub-interface, but as mentioned earlier, if you have a 100 interfaces, should you open a subflow for each one? So. And this is also a free subject from the SCP stack because we only have um, local domain, but not the web address. Do we also do it in the current uh, version? 
Yes, so multipath allows you concurrent, connect concurrent uh, connections, then you can send data concurrent. You can also configure it, I mean, de depending on the use case, for instance, if you want higher throughput, you'll probably want to send uh, packets on, on both or, or multiple um, links. But another interesting use case is if, if you want a lower latency, you may want to duplicate the same um, packet and send the same packet across multiple links and basically that will get you the, the lowest latency if you don't know, I mean, if it's hard to know in advance what the latency is for those links. Um, I, I mean, there are people um, I've been working with that have been doing experiments at the data center. They have seen, uh, personally I, I have not, but I, I know about the, this, this research, uh, and I think that they have seen up to 30% 30, uh, 30 maybe um, even more increase in throughput. It depends on, all depends on the um, first, I mean the topology. Uh, I think that was seen on, in fat trees topologies. Um, there are, I think there, are, there is at least one paper which was presented at um, NDIS um, 2012 maybe 13, I don't remember, which talks about uh, multipath TCP and data center. Eric? Yeah, I had a question about the second path you opened. What makes sure that uh, you hit the same server on the second path? Because most people use load, load balancer, stuff like that. So I'm not sure how you can guarantee that the connection will hit the same uh, uh, yeah, point. I, I think we use um, we 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 send some messages in in the TCP um, when we when we do the negotiation, and I think Christoph maybe can answer that uh, question better. Yeah. So if it, the server is sitting behind a load balancer and the load balancer balances the load based on the on the source IP, which they often do, I think. Um, so there, are, the thing is with MPTSP, you probably will need to put. Uh, uh, if you have a big server farm, to put basically the, to terminate the MPTSP connection at the edge of the edge of the there of your server farm, so basically that all connections get terminated on the same server. Another solution would be, for example, the server can, if the server is sitting behind a load balancer, he could announce, if he has a public IP, he could announce this public IP, and from that moment on, new subloads only go to this public IP. I don't think it works for load balancers. The load balancer either recognizes. Yes. Okay. Does it answer the question, Eric? Okay. Um, any other questions? Yes. If uh, one of the two paths is bad, would it have a, uh, a worse effect than not having the path at all? Yeah, so MPTCP is designed, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, to be as good as, um, at least as TCP. So in the case that the, uh, the, the other path is, is bad and we send a packet and we don't receive an ACK, we will uh, re-inject the packet on the other flow. So uh, it's going to continue um, using the, uh, the, the flow that it, it is good. How do you prevent window collapse in this sort of scenario? I mean, you've got two links here, uh, which are clearly moving at different rates, and one of which has a higher likelihood of dropping frames. How does your other endpoint manage when you get so many frames out of order? So um, the, the the window uh, the uh, the window receive window part is a little bit complicated. Unfortunately, there is no. Explicit, explicit window um, for the whole uh, MPTSP connection. And the decision uh, that has been made by the IATF committee is to use, actually use the windows of the soft flow in order to um, uh, limit or um, influence the, limit, the, the window of the um, multipath connection overall. No, yeah, so here that is because um, I 
not so familiar with that, um, you know, why that has been chosen, but um, as far as I understood from Christoph is because um, adding another, adding another, you know, parameter in the TCP options would mean that we need to add another two bytes and the TCP option space is already limited. So that's, that, that's why they um, choose this approach. Okay. Um, if there are not any more questions, I'm going to move to the, um, basically to the implementation. I'm, I'm going to try to present uh, the um, in, in implementation, initial implementation uh, that has been done. So the initial implementation has been done by um, the academic community, uh, university, Catholic de Louvain has been, um, I think, the driving factor in that. Um, Christophe is one, Christophe as well as Sebastian Barre are one, are the ones who did the initial implementation. And uh, the initial implementation focused on doing these things at the TCP layer uh, level, and that is because of the, some of the stuff that we, uh, we, we mentioned already. Um, it allows us to, to have good performance. Um, it implements stuff like TSO already. Um, um, I think it was, uh, there was an experiment uh, last year or a couple of years ago where you reached like 50, uh, yeah, 50 gigs um, with a single TCP connection. Um, and uh, it also, if you do it implementation at the TCP uh, layer, you will also have a very nice fallback approach. I'm, I'm gonna uh, show you uh, in a couple of slides. Um, of course, this downside of all this is that it has, it, it does a lot of changes to the TCP stack. It, it, it's intrusive, it complicates the stack. Um, it, the, uh, the TCP stack, which is ov already over complicated. So, um, we are trying to see what we can do to, you know, to manage this complexity, to move um, part of this code out outside of the TCP layer and, and put it in a, a separate layer. Uh, in order to understand, you know, um, the, the MPTCP implementation, I'm going to present some key MPTCP structures. So, uh, we have basically three types of um, important structures. The first one is the meta socket, and the meta socket is basically the socket that is visible to the user. Um, and it doesn't have any, you know, it doesn't have any mapping to the actual TCP connections that are going on, the actual subflows. And then we have the subflow uh, sockets, and uh, the subflow sockets are, are uh, two sockets basically because um, one is the, I mean, two types of uh, sockets. One is the master socket, and the other ones are additional subflow sockets. Why it is important to have a master socket? Because uh, without them, uh, we want to be able to do the fallback to TCP, and in that case, we'll see that the master socket becomes a TCP socket. Um, one important thing to note here is that all these sockets are TCP sockets, are implemented as TCP sockets. This has some advantages, but also has some disadvantages. Um, for instance, it's not natural for the, the meta socket to be a TCP socket because it's actually not a TCP connection, right? Uh, but it has some advantages. Uh, one of the advantages is that you don't need to modify the code that touches the MPTCP um, socket queues that transfer data to and from um, user. You can just use um, MPTCP, I mean, you can just use TCP receive message to uh, transfer data uh, from the meta socket uh, queues. Um, it also allows you to transparently switch to uh, and to have a fallback that is, um, has a very low overhead. Um, the downside is that we need to basically be aware of what kind of socket are we dealing with in, in the TCP stack. Um, so we need to check, is this an, a meta socket? Is this a subflow socket? Is this a master socket sometime? Okay, so uh, how is the master socket created? This is, um, Basically, uh, the, the master socket is created and is not created immediately, but is created once we know that we have established that we have we have a multipath um, a TCP connection. So once we have you know that um, ACK and multi MP capable flag available, we will create the master socket. And the master socket is created as sort of a clone. Um, it's a special clone. Initially, it was a special clone because we wanted to treat both, we wanted to have, be able to use both IPv4 and IPv6 on the same um, um, logical connection. 
And um, what allows us, us to do is to, um, in, in, in the case, we are seeing the case that, you know, uh, things go badly, we'll be able to revert back to the uh, TCP socket. So this is, I mean, this, this is nice because you don't create a, a master socket immediately, but on the other hand, you need all this, uh, at least call it the uh, connection layer in order to do the, the clone. Uh, in the case where we fall back to TCP, we just, um, we won't receive the MP capable option. And in that case, what we do, we set, you know, we set the uh, a special flag inside the, uh, the meta socket and the meta socket effectively becomes a TCP socket because we won't take any uh, multi-fact uh, decisions on, on it anymore. Okay, now about how the packets flow through the uh, queue, through the cell flows and to the meta socket, I'm gonna uh, do a uh, um, dive into that, but before that, just a quick um, a summary of how the TCP queues work. Uh, this is just a simplification. So um, we, on the receive side, we have the TCP packets coming th and then they are getting either in the backlog queue if the um, socket is locked or uh, if they go directly to the receive queue. We also, if needed, we, um, there is also the out of order queue if um, the packets um, are not in order. And from the receive queue, uh, the packets are going to be copied to user space through TCP receive message. On the, rec on the send side, we have TCP send message that puts packets into the write queue, and then through either uh, write XMIT or retransmit SKB if we need to do a retransmission, it goes to the TCP transmit SKB, which uh, pulls, the, um, I mean, pushes the packet um, to the IP layer. How, how the uh, packet flows uh, works in the MPTCP case? On the receive path. So on the receive path, um, we have the packets coming in. Uh, of course, they're coming at the soft flow level. Uh, and we put them into the, uh, instead of putting them into the soft flow level, we put them into the uh, meta backlog. Uh, from there, we have, you know, we have um, this nice um, callback function backlog receive. And uh, after you know that function is called, that processes the packets of the uh, backlog queue, we put them into the soft flow receive queue. Um, and then we also have this nice uh, callback function um, SK ready, SK data ready. And through that function, we we take all the packets from the soft flow queue and push them into the uh, meta socket or either the receive queue or the order, uh, out of order queue. So um, yeah, any question? So uh, this design was used in order to, you know, to um, to make sure that we don't we don't change uh, TCP uh, receive message, and um, yeah, it's also a, a, a basically a, a push a push model. Any questions here? Maybe. On the, on the send path, uh, we have a TCP send message function. We are going to put the packet into the meta um, socket write queue. From there, we are going through the MPTCP scheduler. We have also, we have some hooks because um, right now there are not any, you know, um, callbacks like in the receive queue. So we have inserted some hooks into the uh, retransmit SKB and write XMIT uh, functions. And then we push those packets to the MPTCP scheduler and from there, uh, it, it, the scheduler will select the soft flow and will put the packet to the right queue and from there, uh, uh, TCP that does its job. Okay, so um, we also have some issues with the DCC, op DCC options because they are quite big, uh, like 20 bytes, and um, um, ideally we want to save them into the uh, uh, control block, but we didn't have space, so, um, Initially, we, we saved them into the header space. Uh, fortunately, we are, we are able to um, compact the options because not all of them are needed to be saved in CB. So right now, we do not need this mechanism anymore. Uh, so basically, that, that's, that's, uh, that is how you know, the in initial implementation was. As you can see, we have quite a lot of uh, hooks, quite a lot of changes to the TCP stack. Um, and uh, when I started looking at this a couple of years ago to see what we can do in order you know, to shape it, to get it 
easier to be upstream, um, we looked at several approaches. And uh, one of the approaches we explored was, can we do this in user space? Um, and the question, I mean, the, uh, the answer to that, uh, in my opinion, is that we cannot really do that in user space because if you want to do it in user space, you would need to duplicate the existing TCP implementation. I don't think that is good. Um, we could do it maybe if we could have some infrastructure, uh, a way to pass and uh, receive uh, special TCP options, uh, but then what do you do with the handshake? Um, you also need some, you know, um, to, to you know, to have some signaling to, to use the space. So I think at this point, I don't think it's a good idea. Also, I think that the existing implementation, um, it has been working for, you know, three, four years now. There are people using it um, um, and in different uh, projects. Uh, there have been a lot of corner cases which have been, you know, investigated and fixed in the current um, implementation. So it, I think it would be better just to take the existing implementation and shaping up and um, making it you know, going it in the right direction. So the second approach would be to take that and try to manage the complexity by moving the MPTCP stuff in a separate layer. Uh, just like we have, you know, the NFS uh, that uses TCP um, or the, the other file system, uh, CIFS um, file system that uses TCP. Um, conceptually, we, we you know, MPTCP is very similar to that. It should stay on, on a separate layer on top of the TCP stack. Okay. So um, what can we do in order to have a, a, an MPTCP layer? So we need to do a couple of things. Um, one is to isolate the code at the subflow level um, and move it out as much as possible of the, uh, of the TCP stack. Um, and then the other one is to move, uh, to completely move the meta um, socket changes in, in their own layer because this is, this is where uh, they belong, right? So we started looking at the, you know, what is this MPTCP self-flow specific uh, code in TCP? And we identified a few. Most of them, uh, most of it is in the connection handshake, um, the part that deals with the receive window and the part that deals with the send um, and the con couple congestion control. And we started uh, looking how can we move that away. So fortunately there are nice infrastructure already in place in the TCP stack, like you have um, the connect socket operations and that was implemented in order to, um, you know, avoid doing the same things twice or, you know, having ifs in the TCP code in order to treat various um, cases like um, IPv4 case or IPv6 case, right? So um, fortunately those uh, hooks exist there and we are able to use uh, on the, on the um, connection side, on the transmit side, we are able to use those operation and create specific operation for multipath and we move basically all this uh, handshake part out of the TCP um, and it, it now sits in its own nice um, layer. Excuse me, five yes. minutes left. Five minutes left. Thank you. Um, we did the same on the receive side, and uh, um, when you started working on this, there was mm, not, I mean, there, there, was, there was some infrastructure at the MD5, uh, for the MD5, but um, unfortunately it was not um, enough, so we basically extended that. Um, it was nice because with that we were able to also uh, reduce some duplication be between um, IPv4 and IPv6 um, TCP code uh, handling. And eventually we are able to also move the, uh, res the um, res receive side handshake uh, into its own layer. Um, for the other thing, we kind of created a new uh, um, socket operation structure to abstract some of the other operations. I'm not sure if it's, this is the best idea, but it, it at least, you know, you don't have to deal with um, lots of ifs. If you now have operations and you initialize them for uh, meta sockets, for subflow sockets, uh, um, or for regular TCP sockets. Uh, where are we at right now? Uh, this is um, Git diff showing the differences between uh, 3.18 and the um, MPTCP trunk. And you, as you can see, we still have some um, changes done into the TCP stack, um, probably like 1,000 lines of code touched. Uh, but it's not as bad as it, it, it used to be. So I think we are slowly getting there. And right now we are um, have a working progress model where we want to 
basically separate the MPTCP layer. Uh, we are going to create a new socket for uh, the meta, uh, for the meta, uh, new protocol family for uh, meta socket. Uh, and then we are going to redesign the um, receive path uh, because right now we, we are not going to touch at all the, the subflows. We, are, we just load the packets go to the subflow queue and then we will pull the packets out from the subflow um, because we will now be able to have our own MPTCP receive message, message um, implementation and also the same for, for the same path. We want to have our own implementation and, and then push the packets to the subflow level. Um, I think that's uh, basically it. Uh, if you have any questions, comments on, on anything, First slide, you added an option to like connection identity or something. How how the the client builds this uh, this field? How we choose the identity for the connection? Uh, here. Yeah, the MP capable X. What is X exactly? What so uh, this is used in order to negotiate a um, safe, basically to so the the client and server will negotiate a. Um, um, secret, and that is going to be used uh, when you join the connection, so that you, the server knows that this join request comes from the same client. Okay, so that's a crypto. Yeah, I, it, yeah, yeah. It's cryptographic. It's I think HMAC. We use HMAC to. Okay. Do you support bidirectional connection establishment? That is to say, if your phone there connects through the 3G cell tower and the yeah. remote system has a secondary interface, will it attempt to send a SIN back through over its other interface? Not at this time. So r right now we only support connection from the client to the, to the server. Uh, there are, um, basically if you have another interface uh, popping up with the server, you will have an um, NP address um, a message sent to the client and the client will s open the connection to the server. Um, I think that is desirable because if you have NAT and you know um, middle boxes, it's easier to open the connection from the client side. But in the future, uh, maybe we can even do that. The, 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 the standard permits that. After your changes to the TCP stack, uh, if I want to disable MPTCP option uh, administratively, would you allow Socket creation in one step, or there are still two sockets, meta socket and the master socket. If you disable it, no, you will only have um, one. one There's socket only one. Create. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and there is already a sys. Um, we have a sys um, sysfs entry which allows you to control that. Um, if people want to continue asking questions, it's okay. Uh, but there's food probably of an hour long, and you can talk to. Uh, afterwards to door. Um, I have a question. So on the socket interface, is this transparent to user application or they need to show it on the specific socket? Right now it is transparent. Uh, so uh, the, the, the application doesn't need to change. Um, however, we are um, we are thinking of moving to the direction where the you know you need to open up a specific um, if you want an MPTCP socket, you would need to, uh, you know, use a special uh, socket syscall. Uh, that is because it will. We think it will significantly reduce the. Um, um, it will significantly reduce the intrusiveness of the implementation to the TCP stack. Now, with that being said, we we can actually uh, we thought of that, and we can still make it transparent by redirecting the the socket call. Uh, the INET layer, you know, if you have some special CFS setting, we'll redirect all the TCP um, socket um, calls to be actually MP TCP socket calls. Okay. Um, so the last slide, the Um, I still wanted to ask about the um, master socket and the subflow. So the master 
So do you mean? Uh, Sorry. Master socket is eventually the one that falls back to a normal TCP if there's a problem, for example, in some middle yes. box or, and that uh, master socket would basically, based on your path properties, uh, change uh, during runtime, or is that uh, fixed or? I no, mean, like, the, like the, yeah, the master socket is the first socket that is created. Um, I mean, when. With the first socket that is created as a, as a clone after the meta socket when we receive the MP capable thing, uh, option. So it, it doesn't change. I mean, you cannot select uh, other sockets to be the master socket. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, Christoph, you, do you want to take that? I think it's very similar to the other question. Yeah. Oh, can you please repeat your question? Uh, in the case of uh, content providing CDN, like uh, network, the content is pretty involved in network CDN. I'm just wondering how uh, multicast TCP would cope with that, where content might be closer on to the home network path than the IP path. Yeah, so if you have kind of an any cast address to um, to the content provider and this one sits in different places depending on the ISP. Um, it's not sure whether, for example, for, I don't know, an Akamai use case, you would want to have MPTCP because, well, you might get over a suboptimal path, definitely. There might be benefits and disadvantages of using M MPTCP in a content provider use case, definitely. Yeah, Apple is using Siri, uh, MPTCP. <laughs> and um, there are many other users of MPTCP. Also, there are many um, startups who are using it, basically to, um, in rural areas where, for example, the DSL connection is very crappy, then they have a DSL or two DSL connections. They are bonding their interfaces and terminating their TCP connections somewhere in the cloud. And that way, they have a better, better user experience. So I think there are now two startups who have been created just around MPTCP. Yeah, so, yeah, if, uh, thank you very much for attending the presentation. Um, I'll be here, and uh, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, please, um, uh, contact me and thank you.